All right, so let's uh, let's get started on this uh, overview of the breakout session. So the goal here is to see uh, what everybody come up with in terms of science, um, you know, uh, cases, but also to see what kind of commonalities we can find between those science cases and you know what what can emerge. Um, so we all have just a few minutes uh, per per group, five minutes total per group. Um, and yeah, try to highlight those commonalities that may be interesting for the people uh, to see. So because the slides are in random order, uh, maybe you know which one is yours, but uh, be always on the lookout. I will go in, in order here. And uh, for presenting, I suppose you can just uh, use the mic on your, on, your, um, on your seat. So we'll start with extragalactic viability. Who wants to take this one, Colin? Yes, can you hear? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so our extragalactic variability, we have two slides, but this is one of our examples, which focuses on changing look AGNs. So these are AGNs that undergo dramatic changes in their flux uh, and spectral properties uh, within the time scale of a few weeks or so. And uh, outside of that, they look like normal quasars or even just normal galaxies uh, before their accretion state changes. Uh, dramatically. So uh, one approach is to look at the variability behavior. We're very interested in the variability behavior for these AGNs um, and correlations with other data, like, for instance, the mass of the supermassive black hole or other multi-wavelength data. Um, and so to do a lot of that, we might need photo Z information, for instance. Uh, the mode of access would first be data release catalogs to select like a catalog of AGNs that are variable. Uh, but the idea is once we've selected, say, a handful of AGNs that could be changing look quasars or changing look quasar candidates um, that we've flagged as interesting, uh, we've been thinking about, can we get something faster than waiting for the next data release? For instance, do we want to have a handful of AGNs that we can monitor um, and say, okay, this one may not flare enough to generate an alert, but we want to monitor that in between the uh, data sets. Data releases. Uh, the mode of processing, since there, are, since there aren't that many changing look AGNs, uh, we would just do you know, per catalog, uh, even with LSST, they're quite rare. Um, and, but we really need multi-wavelength and spectra, uh, spectroscopic information to study them. So um, the tools for the light curve uh, analysis would be structure function or Gaussian process modeling of light curves. Um, so we have some more detailed information about that in our paper. And the main technical challenge is what information can we extract from the variability without a spectrum? Can we get variability estimates for all sources initially, like every galaxy, so that we can identify which ones are AGNs? And uh, where is the follow-up spectra coming from, I should say? Um, and can we get potentially higher cadence uh, targeted photometry for those AGNs that we've identified as special uh, changing look candidates like in between the data releases. Um, so we don't have to wait in case we missed it when it goes off. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. That's it. Uh, if, even now, I mean, even from this mic or from the other? If you're speaking, can you please use a C mic for the individuals on Zoom? Yeah. Um, okay, great. So um, I think what we can do is go over the other uh, slides from that same group, um, and then we'll keep discussion towards the end. Um, but because things are in random order, um, let's see, what is the next one in extragalactic viability? Do you have? It should be the second one from the last. Okay, okay. Second one from the last. Okay. All right. Uh, who wants to take it away? All right. I'll go with it. Um, 
So the title is find all the AGN as soon as possible. I think there are uh, multiple things connected in this slide. One is finding as many AGNs as possible, uh, you know, as soon as possible, because AGN has really long uh, term <coughs> variability where uh, in the first couple of years, LST will not provide the information needed to do the selection. So as soon as possible. And to do that, we really need a um, long baseline, uh, which what we can do is uh, by taking advantage of archival data. So that was linked first document is uh, John calibration uh, and lead curve generation for uh, using archival data. And at the same time, if we have you know, longer baseline from precursor surveys, uh, we can uh, better classify AGNs by doing augmentation. Um, that is, uh, we can take advantage of other telescope time to distinguish between different variability characteristics and then to classify them. Uh, there's uh, two science cases that's listed there. First is finding all the AGNs. Finding all the AGNs is not just finding them, but it does provide a timely uh, catalog of objects to study them in detail. Uh, for example, uh, you know, draw, you know, black holes in dwarf uh, galaxies or lens uh, objects. They all can, uh, if we have a catalog at early times of LST, then we'll have um, a lot to do with them. Mode access, so mostly just catalogs. We need to query for a time series, and um, really, I would say maybe uh, images for uh, visualization and, and, and uh, diagnostics. Uh, mode of processing uh, is catalog based, uh, it's embarrassingly parallel. Uh, we also want um, catalogs from multi wavelengths, you know, multi wavelengths catalogs, and then we can do cross match for a classification and study uh, the properties of agents in different wavelengths. External data, um, the two categories one is time domain. Like I mentioned earlier, we need really need long baselines, so we need to you know, catalyze the whole precursor surveys to produce a more homogeneous uh, long-term, you know, longer baseline light curves from all the precursor surveys listed there that we can take advantage of. The multi-wavelength uh, catalogs, like from X-ray to uh, infrared, those are the two very important uh, wavelengths range that can help aging classification. In terms of um, tools, uh, currently, we do have some tools. Well, it relies, relies on some parametric fitting of the light curves. So, uh, fast camera fits. We can. We need really fast ones to apply to a lot of light curves, millions of light curves. So, fast uh, algorithms, Gaussian process, uh, maybe just deep neural networks uh, that we do uh, as well. So, the main uh, technical challenges we need: John calibrate precursor surveys and a lot of C. So there's uh, a lot of the big technical challenges in terms of calibration, and um, one reason we can take advantage of those precursor surveys, like uh, commissioning, that will uh, cover a lot of the uh, northern part. So that overlap with the precursor survey, which is mainly on the northern hemisphere, and um, cross matching with large external catalogs, like, like the multi wavelength catalogs. Uh, and the blend lens AGNs uh, for uh, better separation and the study of sources. Yes, thank you. Is there another viable slide that I don't see here? That's it? Yeah, yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, fantastic, okay. So in the same uh, time domain thing, I think there's the transient works we can move on to next. Um, I see a slide at the beginning here. This is the first one. I have three in a row here. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so I just um, started with a shot of our, our whiteboard just to show that we did a lot of work. Um, and we, so we ran through a bunch of ideas and then found a few general categories. And um, two of the main ones that we're focusing on are target of opportunity um situations and then also um 
multi-stream transient detection. So I'm going to, in the next two slides, I'm just going to go over those for the whole group. Um, and this is all other people's work. So everybody in our group, feel free to correct me. Um, you can go on to the next slide. OK, so the target of opportunity cases. Um, so the science case for this is um, we're looking at TOO cases outside of the obvious gravitational wave. Um, TOOs that are a really, um, I guess, easy sell to people. So these are other cases where it's really helpful to have LSST, where you have poor localization, and you'll benefit from the deep and wide field of view in the optical. So the things that we had in mind were fast radio bursts, neutrinos, gamma ray bursts, um, gravitational waves, which I mentioned, pulsar timing ray hotspots, and um, also the very important unknown unknowns, the things that um, we hope to find with LSST that we don't know about yet. Um, so the mode of access for this is going to be the, the TO observations. Um, what we need for this is a flexible strategy to decide on TOOs that come from different sources. Um, for this, we need some prioritization of alerts. So deciding among these um, among these different sources with a small amount of time that's available for TOOs, what, what are the most important ones? Um, and the important thing with this is that we also need a lot of co communication and coordination with multi-wavelength and multi-messenger experiments. Um, so this goes to the external data that's required. Um, so that's alerts from other experiments, need algorithms for triggering, um, ranking those triggers, and whatever contextual information is needed um, to filter the events. So you need, as a tool, you need a flexible schedule, scheduler. Um, and then the technical challenge is that, um, you know, if you're working on the main science, uh, main science surveys, you don't want to be interrupted. So you need, you need strong motivations for these TOOs. Um, Missing from this is just the strategy for multiple science cases outside of uh, gravitational waves. Um, and then just the last point with the TOOs is that since these are one about 1% 1 of the data, the um, uh, motto that the group would like is, we are the 1%. Um, OK, so you can go on to the next slide. OK, so the other science case is the multi-stream transient detection. and characterization. So um, obviously, we have a lot of data coming through the alert broker for LSST, but um, we want to combine this with other data sets. So uh, this is um, using the multi-stream, uh, sorry, using uh, transient alerts from other surveys that are going on and combining those with on the LSST data and including the images and intermediate metadata and using that to do an improve, get an improved scientific yield. Um, so this should be really valuable for rapidly evolving transients um, and newly observed events and things that are often misclassified. Um, so the proposed mode of access is a Jupyter notebook or API queryable access to broker uh, um, sorry, broker, I'm going to say broker like streams. Okay. Uh, and so what you need for this is an alert stream uh, positional cross match. Um, and you need meta catalogs and metadata for the various alert streams. Um, OK, so the external data required, of course, you need the broker information from all of these other surveys that would be um, applicable to to combine with LSST. So this is a potentially um, very large data set. Um, a lot of cross matching with hosts is also something that's needed. And it would be helpful to also have like catalogs of all the publicly available spectra. Um, tools needed would be methods for doing efficient cross matching between positions for the different alert streams. Um, and then you're going to need the uh, data storage to manage um, various streams. Uh, so we proposed a HTTP API access with maybe um, web visualization interface. 
Um, and so the main technical challenge is then going to be uh, just synthesizing the various architectures and schemas for these alert streams. And then there's a political challenge just being able to work with different collaborations. Okay, so I think that's everything we have for the um, extra galactic transients. So for, for the full group, uh, what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, before we move on to the next, is there like uh, particular aspects of, of um, transient data that you would like to highlight that would be applicable to both this use case and the previous one? You mentioned storage, and I don't think, for instance, that was mentioned before. Um, database storage of light curves for transient data. Sorry, what was the... the data storage, no, my question is the data storage tools um, mm -hmm. that you have here, for instance, is it common to the previous use case or is it different? Um, I think that's, that's outside of my expertise on this. Um, I don't know if anybody else would, would you like to comment? Yeah, I can say something. I think it's similar but different. Okay. Uh, my understanding from the Aegean people is they want a lot of historical data. I think this is aiming for more like live data so we can get like upper limits on an object that just happens. Maybe we have a DDTF limit, but like a newest passing observation or something. Got it. Okay, thanks. Right, great. So let's move to the to the next group. Um, let's see. What do we have next here? Uh, is this is this a good one to follow up on? Who wants to follow? Yeah. Uh, oh, let me re reload maybe. <laughs> okay. Busted. Busted. No, no, no. Busted. <laughs> All right. Do you want to take it away? Yeah, sorry. Um, so planets are expected around main sequence stars, and main sequence stars evolve into white dwarfs. You'd expect many plan or planets to be around white dwarfs, but we haven't detected very many. In fact, I think there was just one uh, massive planet uh, paper published two years ago, last year-ish. Um, so the idea is to uh, have uh, calibrated image cutouts for um, LSST and use force photometry on each of these for individual white dwarf uh, systems, um, trying to detect uh, deep eclipses that you expect from these uh, substellar objects uh, around white dwarfs. Um, on the right here, I am just included uh, two images from ZTF data that show uh, what appears to be a grazing eclipse and a white dwarf brown dwarf candidate and a, a total eclipse. Um, but this is not force photometry data that we are looking at. It is actually just uh, uh, standard aperture photometry. So on the bottom image, we notice that there is no data in the minimum of the eclipse. Uh, white dwarfs are typically 1% of a solar radii, but the substellar companions could be 10%. So you actually see complete eclipses almost. Um, if we did force photometry, we actually gain the data that's not being shown here, which improves our uh, uh, sampling and our signal to noise for our, in our case, box least squared uh, period finding algorithm. Um, so in this case, our mode of, mode of processing would be a box least squared analysis of all white dwarfs that show uh, greater than some number of three sigma, four sigma, five sigma deviations from the alert stream. Um, to do this, uh, since we're looking at objects that have long periods, 10 hours or a little bit over a day, uh, for 10-minute eclipses, we're not very likely to catch these um, eclipses in a short amount of time with LSST. So we're going to combine data from other Southern Sky surveys, such as Black Gym, which is starting relatively soon, um, to have a, a better sampling across the entire light curve. Um, in terms of tools, it's relatively straightforward. We have AstroPy, we have um, uh, self-made box least squared tools, and then we have um, what I'm hoping uh, for an accurate and precise LSST force photometry algorithm. Um, the main technical challenge is in we have uh, long period short eclipses. Um, these objects entirely disappear, so you have to use force photometry, otherwise you're not going to have data for these minimum of the eclipses. Uh, and it's computationally expensive to find these uh, periods uh, in a very dense and large or wide periodogram. Um, and all we're missing for that now is deep southern sky coverage uh, with time series. Uh, ZTF covers the northern sky relatively well and acts as a really good test case for this. Um, and again, on the right, we have two ZTF magnitude images or uh, light curves, but not flux images or light curves. Uh, that's all we have for uh, the specific subsample. And on the top, we also have a, a little link for 
uh, white dwarf binaries with white dwarfs, so Lisa verification systems. But this one is a stronger, compelling case for forcing force photometry with LSST. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I think the next one actually falls in the same category, right? That's right. Um, can you refresh again? Because yes. I think yes. there was editing <laughs> done okay. just literally in the second set. <laughs> okay, so so this was certainly not my um, science use case that I proposed, but the person who wanted to give it is virtual. So I am speaking on behalf of Rachel. The idea here is that um, we hope that LSST will help us find microlensing events for stars and compact objects because there are gazillions of these things across the Milky Way and the Magellanic Clouds. Um, specifically, we're hoping to enhance the scientific return to, um, from microlensing events detected by the Roman survey in the bulge. Um, the the uh, mode of access seems depends on the multi-band light curve data that's delivered in real time in order to detect and prioritize events that are in progress, microlensing events in progress, but uh, we also would require access to annual data release projects because sometimes there are long baseline light curves. Um, the mode of processing is highly parallelized per event light curve modeling. So there's gonna be tons of these types of events. So we need to do per event light curve modeling. Um, also uh, processing real-time modeling of incomplete event light curves based on broker alerts. The external data that will be required will be um, data for, from Roman for, for the Galactic Bulge Survey, as well as um, data that is comp at complementary wavelengths to Rubin. That will also be very, very helpful. And then we have more on the next slide to keep our uh, text large. Good, okay. Uh, the tools that are needed are, I'm like reading this, okay. Um, we already have things like detection and classification algorithms, but taking in multiple input sources is not something that's done yet. Um, similarly, uh, light curve modeling software also already exists. Target and observation manager prototypes already exist, but I think getting everything working together in real time is, is the, um, need here. The main challenge is combining event detections from different brokers, um, as I basically just said, as well, we'll need a bunch of computing power to do this type of thing. So that's maybe not a technical challenge so much as a like hardware challenge. Um, so what are some things that are missing to do this now? One of the biggest things is that there will be binary events and we just don't have that um, infrastructure for modeling these types of systems and validating them. So um, handling binaries in general is something that needs a lot of development and it's a really non-trivial problem. Um, and then the final thing that we wanted to point out is that uh, there are many, many similar challenges that exist for other use cases that depend on um, modeling enormous sets of light curves to explore a population. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to find the other slide decks around this. There's maybe the another okay. galactic. Yeah, that's all for your group. Thank you. Great. So the next one, um, I guess we can move on to this category. Who wants to take this? Uh, yeah, I can take that. Um, so yeah, so we're in local universe static now, um, and we're talking about mapping the accreted and intrinsic stellar populations in the Milky Way. So uh, essentially constraining what the density distribution of the Milky Way looks like, uh, starting from the outer disk and going all the way to the edge of the galaxy. Um, for the most part, this is just running queries uh, based on the co-added catalogs. Um, we would like we would like to have uh, on each object be able to be able to compute a metallicity and and distance um, and then fold that in to some sort of uh, densely mo modeling or likelihood of uh, evaluation um, and that, and so that'll be you know querying the querying SQL, SQL to get a table of say PHP stars and then tossing that into your mod modeling code. Um, 
in terms of external data sets, uh, using Gaia astrometry combined with uh, DECAM photometry, you can basically calibrate this methodology for brighter sources. And then just uh, once everything looks good for that, just run it on the fainter L uh, sources in LSST. Um, most of this uses uh, like your typical Python astronomy stack, um, but we'll need a package or algorithm for, for modeling the density structure in kind of more a robust way than we've, than we've done in the past, instead of doing kind of you know, spherical shells, allowing things to have local over or under densities that vary as, as a function of distance. Um, there's kind of two technical challenges here. Um, because we're measuring, we want to measure densities, we need to know the selection function and how that's impacting our inference. Um, and so folding that into some sort of really uh, complicated large likelihood function. Um, and then we, we also want to you know, have this modeling scheme that allows for substructures and asymmetries and also be able to back out the 3D density um, where everything is kind of physically real. So you know, the density is always, is always positive. Um, what's missing to do this right now were you know, the two things that are above, but also probably technical things that we might not know. Um, and then uh, we, we sort of have a strong feeling that uh, U-band will be critical for getting photometric metallicities. So you can separate out uh, individual uh, halo stellar populations with that. Yeah. And I think, our, I think the next slide is still local universe static, but, but an, another project. Thank you. Um, so the title says we're generally interested in properties of low mass stars for this project. Um, and that's really because physical properties of these stars, I'm talking about like mass, radius, metallicity, luminosity, um, really are fundamental to understanding um, and interpreting these stellar populations and substellar populations. So specifically things like M dwarfs, round dwarfs, white dwarfs. Um, and these are interesting to people um, outside the stellar community as well. We wanted to mention because many of these um, stars and sub substars um, host extrasolar planets. So understanding the physical properties of the hosts is really important to like understanding what's going on with these planets. Um, but the, the main science case that we want to bring forward is really that um, when determining the mass function for these populations, um, you really need a large sample, especially at the, ma uh, the lower mass end to determine these sorts of things. Um, and really this is only going to be able to be done with really deep observations and again, a large number of objects to get the statistics. Um, which LSST will be able to give us. Um, how we're going to be accessing all this data for the low mass stars is pretty much we can get most of everything that we need from the object catalog, um, and then also getting some other data from the source data um, below this. Um, and with the object catalog to do the processing, um, basically what we're going to be looking for is kind of um, creating multiple subsamples of low mass stars um, by defining ones that we only have photometry with, some that we might have photometry and proper motions, and others which we have photometry and um, all astro uh, good astrometric measurements. Um, in a subsection of this also, in each of these samples, um, we're also going to be tasked with um, trying to identify all of the variable sources um, in, these, in this catalog. Because again, we are the static universe. So I guess we kind of want to ignore the variable things for the time being. Um, so that comes up in the next step where we actually do have to go into um, the source data and go on a per object basis within the catalog to process the light curves, identify, identify variable stars, um, which is something that we could do in parallel, maybe kind of quickly. Um, yeah, but basically how we're going to do all the above should be able to be done with some kind of complicated SQL query um, based on some formula that we uh, determine later. Um, External data-wise, though, we will rely heavily on things like uh, like the Gaia catalog, that CAM, and spectroscopic surveys, um, as these data sets are really going to provide the calibration that we need to understand the relationship between the um, LSST, LSST data and the physical properties of these stars. Um, and this is going to total in probably the tens of terabytes amount of data. Um, there's one more slide after this. Yes. Um, and the tools to do this is, I think we can do it mostly with QServe, so do it mostly with some complicated SQL type things. Um, but the main challenges that we came up with um, through our discussion, which were mostly scientific in nature, 
um, is really that we need to understand the selection effects that are going to go into this project. So we're doing a lot of subsampling to so understand what that does to the following science. Um, we need to ensure that we're accurately um, classifying the low mass stars, especially without astrometry. Um, and this kind of feeds into like differentiating between low mass stars and galaxies in some um, degrees. Um, and then also, of course, the biggest challenge is modeling the results and getting good calibration relationships. Um, the biggest thing that we found that we were missing um, in our discussions is we really wanted to try to figure out a way to identify parameters in just the object catalog that we could use to characterize stellar variability. Um, we think that some of these probably exist. We didn't know what they were. Um, we have a source that we put up on the, the screen, um, which is a document that might give us some hints. But as of right now, we couldn't figure out which parameter would best do that for us. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Thank you. And I think this is the last, last slide for that category, right? Awesome, great. So let's move on to cosmology. And uh, yeah, do you want to take the first one? Yes. So <clears throat> this is the first of three slides. Uh, I will do the first two. Uh, we came up with a bunch of different projects uh, and ideas in the cosmology session. I'm going to start with this one, which is uh, basically the one that identifies a sort of standalone kind of ideas. Um, the um, main idea behind it is that when uh, CMB photons travel towards us, they interact with the uh, last case structure of, that are forming at the same time, and they leave some imprint. So we can use uh, a CMB as a last case structure probe to, uh, together with uh, last case structure tracer that come from LSST. The elevator pitch for this would be that we want to constrain the gas properties and dark matter halos using CMB information. This can be achieved uh, through two main observables, the, the thermal and kinetics when you have the Lovitch effect that essentially probe the pressure profiles and um, the velocity and density of the baryons within dark matter halos. What we would need for this uh, um, on the LSST side would be essentially catalog, catalog galaxies uh, to which we want to apply uh, various cuts, uh, the, the um, right shift cuts or um, color cuts to select different environments. This can all be derived um, from uh, some of the early data release. And once we have that, we basically we need to create galaxy over density maps and calculate some cross correlation uh, statistics, either in real space or harmonic space, with uh, the CMB temperature maps or the maps of the spinal Zeldovich effect that we can extract from CMB. And we will also need to uh, take into account all the um, ensemble NLZ uncertainties into this process, um, which might also require some cross-correlation with um, uh, uh, other spectroscopic uh, survey like DESI. Uh, so the external data, of course, required for this are uh, CMB. Uh, we identified, I think, SO, Simon's Observatory, as the main overlapping data set in terms of time. And, uh, uh, but anything that would have some reasonable uh, overlap with the LSST will work. Um, we also need, again, uh, some um, coverage common with some spectroscopic survey. Go to the next slide. So tools, uh, we need to use map making software um, developed within LSST to get uh, resolution maps of the galaxy over density and also uh, maps of the observational quantity that can also inform sample selection and also uh, the um, cross-correlation statistics, say, if we want to downweight some specific uh, area of the sky uh, that is contaminated by some systematic. Um, then we will need cross-correlation uh, statistics uh, code, uh, code to compute these statistics um, and uh, something to infer uh, N of Z. The, once we have the measurements, then we will need to fit theory prediction uh, through some MCMC or likely free uh, inference technique. Um, and the main technical challenge we identified, so these are tools that to some extent already exist and are common to other cosmology pro projects that we need to carry out. The main technical challenge we identified for this is the forward modeling of this signal, which is non-trivial and the need of joint simulation between LSST and uh, all the CMB probes. Um, there are already projects doing this, but the 
at, at this present stage, the current surveys are limited by uh, the sky coverage or the sensitivity. So the precision will increase a lot. And uh, yeah, anything else? I think I already said that one. <laughs> Thanks. We have another slide in the cosmology group. Um, some... yeah. <clears throat> so in uh, discussing uh, external data sets that, that could um, add power to LSST, we uh, talked about the DESI uh, spectroscopic survey and how the gains of having precise uh, spectro spectroscopic redshifts for our lens sample might benefit over a traditional photo Z sample and how we might uh, combine the DESI sample with LSST and galaxy shapes in a sort of two by two point analysis uh, to constrain cosmological parameters, galaxy bias, the intrinsic alignments and redshift uncertainties on the samples. Um, the mode of access for, for such an analysis would just be catalogs and maps over the, the joint jointly observed areas of LSST and DESI. Um, the processing would be fairly straightforward in how we, how we uh, brainstormed it out, uh, define the shape sample and redshift tomographic bins, uh, perform a two by two point co correlation analysis, run a likelihood modeling, probably doing a computation of the covariance matrix and then do posterior sampling to generate your um, cosmological inference and constraints on things like your galaxy bias evolution. Um, things are a little more complicated than that, of course, because with, with DESI, um, often the ensemble N of Z measurements that are performed, which have been mentioned by the, the previous group as well, are done by cross-correlating with DESI or other large spectroscopic samples. So if we're using DESI spectroscopy, both on the calibration side of the photometric redshifts and in the science analysis, we have to worry about an extra covariance there. And that's one of the... Um, technical challenges that we, we did not list on the slide, but discussed within the group. Uh, external data that's required is obviously the DESI LRG sample. Uh, a potential way of mitigating that uh, calibration is using, say, one of the DESI samples, like the LRG sample as your lens sample, and trying to do your cross-correlation cal calibration with the ELGs and quasars, which should be somewhat independent of those. Um, have that data required to, to um, do the photo Z distribution and shape samples. We think we can just use uh, tree core and existing likelihood modeling codes such as CCL and samplers such as Cosmosis to perform these analyses. However, one of the technical challenges there is that having a complex photo Z distribution means that we have a very high dimensional posterior space uh, for our photo Z distributions. And that will require very efficient sampling uh, in order to determine these parameters efficiently. And th that probably needs some work before it is feasible. Uh, what's missing right now is the modeling framework and obviously the data. And there is also uh, some discussion of potential systematics from the fact that both surveys are observing the same area of sky at higher mass, one from the north and one from the south, and that could have potential systematics. So, I think Rachel, you wanted to mention something as well? <laughs> She's on a... um, yeah, so... Um, just separate from these science cases from cosmology. We had all static probe people. We didn't have anybody who works on type 1A supernova or um, strong lensing cosmography or cosmology with standard sirens. So if there's somebody here who works on that, who maybe went to one of the other groups today, um, we'd love to have you join us uh, tomorrow morning so that we can in inject some more variety into our science cases tomorrow. Um, if not, I might try my hand at one of them, which would be either hilarious or terrible, but um, I encourage um, an expert to, to come and join us for that, because I think it'll be very interesting to identify some of the commonalities and tools needed between those science cases and some of the, the, the non-cosmology time domain science. Rachel, so in order to keep you up on your feet, we're gonna skip to solar system. Uh, keeping uh, extra static extragalactic for last, um, as instructed. Let me see. Next one. Yeah, I think this is the first one, right? Yeah, so uh, I'll talk to, talk to this slide. Um, so LSST is going to discover about 5 million new solar system objects. We currently know 1.1 million. 
And it's going to do this kind of remarkable feat by observing what's known as a tracklet, which is effectively a pair of observations uh, taken within a night. Um, and ideally, not spaced more than 90 minutes apart. Um, and while this is very effective, there's still going to be some objects that are not going to be observed with that kind of cadence and won't be able to be discovered in, in, in that way. And that includes things that are very fast moving or also on the more extreme end, things that are very far away where in 90 minutes you just don't discern enough motion to be able to uh, get two individual observations. It would effectively be binned in a single uh, source in a difference image. Um, and so the subtlety here is that if you can enable this kind of non-tracklet uh, discovery algorithm, you can also start thinking about uh, perhaps even relaxing the, uh, the cadence requirements for LSST, which could be useful for, for other science objectives here as well. Um, of course, you know, it's still a tall order and there's still quite a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, for the mode of access for a non-tracklet discovery algorithm would effectively be working on different image sources. Uh, which you can even think about just running on the alert stream. Uh, you would do some initial filtering to uh, only isolate uh, effectively things that are candidate source system objects. Again, a priori, we don't actually know if it is a source system object until you discover it, but you can do some clever filtering to, uh, to just uh, minimize that, that alert volume. Uh, the cool thing about an example code that is uh, uh, with, that works without tracklets is uh, that it's embarrassingly parallel. Uh, it's it's actually super embarrassing parallel because there's multiple axes of parallelization and and different chunking that you can do, um, and the way that this would work is you would effectively run this as nightly observations are made, um, and there's also an argument to be made for a use case where uh, you would might might want to think of running a a, a longer job at a monthly kind of cadence. Uh, the core code is written in Python plus a little bit of acceleration with Numba. But there's no reason it can't be dropped down to C++, and at that point, uh, you get significant speed gains. Um, for external data required, so initially, of course, you'd run this on the LSD observations. But their kind of a extravagant uh, moonshot goal would be to also include other catalogs from different t telescopes, where there could be objects that you don't observe, uh, that you don't get enough observations within the LSD data set, but you could start thinking about doing cross-survey. Uh, source system object discovery, and then of course always acquiring more observations of objects to constrain their orbital parameters as useful, and especially if you can extend them to different catalogs. Uh, in terms of tools, the, so the code to do non-tracked discovery already exists. Uh, again, it's written in Python, and it's built open source upon uh, different community codes like AstroPy and OpenOrb. Now, one thing that we found is uh, there's really two kind of areas of improvement for this code. Is first, you know, there still need to be some significant optimizations and improvements to speeding up the algorithm. And also, uh, it doesn't work for all populations in the source system currently, although theoretic theoretically it should be possible given enough compute power. And the second thing that, the, and this is more a technical implementation, is uh, we have trouble actually scaling uh, to, to tens of thousands of cores or distributing the, the code over, um, over many machines, mainly because there's no obvious general solution where you know, given, given a software code, let it distribute it over many machines and get those results back, back to the user. And especially if you have like AWS, Google Cloud, and all the different different backend providers, it gets complicated to really enable that. And so having a tool that could do that for us, where we could implement this code, would really be uh, something super useful. Um, but yeah, that's that's that. That's a great point, Ryan. Yeah, very much resonate with that, that particular point. Uh, I think there is another. Solar system slide. Hi, um, I'm Henry. Um, so yeah, so the other solar system uh, case that we talked about today is uh, detecting activity uh, in small solar system bodies. So the uh, basic science case is to improve our understanding of active phenomena in small solar system objects. So this could be due to cometary activity, which is um, attributed to sublimation of ice. Um, or it could be asteroid disruption events due to impacts or fast rotation. Um, and so this will require uh, LSST to reliably detect activity over a wide range of brightnesses um, and uh, morphologies. Um, so the mode of access uh, is that we will require uh, image data. Um, and the sizes of these cutout of the cutouts that we'll need is uh, as yet undetermined, um, but could be relatively large. Um, since some of the 
uh, search algorithms we've been talking about um, require sort of our own independent characterization of the sky background, um, or activity can also exist uh, on kind of large spatial scales. Um, so mode of processing uh, can be, oh, sorry, can you uh, <laughs> refresh this? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking at my, so you were. Looking at my version, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, let's see if I missed anything. Okay, yeah, so um, so this can be parallelized. parallelized. Um, because we're looking for different activity uh, morphologies, um, oh, so, so each object can be kind of analyzed on their own, or at least the same image can be analyzed. Um, but we may uh, also require multiple search algorithms because each algorithm will be best at detecting different morphologies. Um, uh, in terms of external data, um, uh, getting archival detections of active object candidates um, will be nice to have, but not essential, uh, just for a confirmation. Um, and the data sources of this archival data kind of include a lot of usual suspects for a lot of people, I think. Um, and these are also coincidentally useful as precursor data sets for testing. Um, tools, there's various pre-written code from different people with different levels of automation currently. Um, we probably also need to write some new codes for things that are kind of more conceptual right now. Um, and uh, we may incorporate citizen science, so we'll need tools to, to kind of push data to there. Um, the main technical challenge we talked about was this access to cutout image data uh, for all solar system object detections every single night. Um, and the processing has to keep up with the data acquisition because we want to enable a uh, follow-up. Um, and so what's missing right now for us at least is the developing the developing or modifying or automating the activity detection code um, so it can run at large scales. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so I think that leaves extra galactic. Yeah, I saw the last one. Yep. Uh, so the first one. Uh, yes. Uh, so several of us have been to work on how to build a So we, we mostly, uh, so we have sort of different science cases, but they also require the same. Product. So we just we did it in one one science case. Um, so uh, we would like. So basically, the the idea is that, or the motivation is that, very little is known about dwarf galaxies beyond the Milky Way. There have been some uh, surveys that, but are pretty limited in terms of area and just number statistics. And LSSC is going to help us to to actually map uh, the census of these low surface brightness galaxies uh, across you know the the survey footprint and out to much uh, larger distances than, than just the local group or a local volume. Um, so we would like to map uh, such census, which includes gener generating a catalog and also doing uh, actually the photometry for all of these galaxies where, where we optimize for uh, the fact that there are low of brightness in nature, uh, which might be different from massive bright galaxies. And very important, uh, we need to um, to measure the, the distances to these galaxies, we think uh, we're going to do by using surface brightness fluctuations, but that's also in the challenges I'll get to in a sec. Uh, and then the science cases that this is going to enable are measuring various distribution functions of some global galaxy properties, that, such as the stellar mass function, um, and then um, measuring some scaling relations, such, such as size uh, mass relation. And also using these dwarf galaxies as lenses uh, to measure, to map the dark matter profile of their halos out to the outskirts of the halo. We think uh, that we're gonna, we're not sure, it's not gonna be quite the catalog level and not also the, the, the fit files, but something in between. So we think that we'll need to use some intermediate data products. So um, catalogs with some flags for potential low surface brightness features uh, during the deblending stage. Um, we're not quite sure about the mode of processing. We, we hope to talk about it more tomorrow. I will definitely need some training or test data from other uh, surveys to uh, validate that our techniques uh, uh, work. And mostly there are a lot of technical challenges, um, understanding the 
time modeling and subtraction, making sure that we uh, that it, it conserves uh, the low surface brightness galaxies that we are looking for, uh, blending and shredding of galaxies, um, dealing with galactic spirits, which is a big challenge for low surface brightness science, um, understanding our completeness and purity of the catalog, uh, and whether we can actually measure distances uh, given the depth of the survey. Thank you. Um, are we getting to that? Uh, well, hello. I guess I'll, I'll start with uh, two disclaimers. One is that, you know, I'm spokesperson for this group, but I'm actually not the person who had the idea for the science case, or you know, I didn't put in any work. So I just want Gabriele and then uh, Charlotte. Uh, also had uh, some science. The work that Rafael, Alex, and Julia, besides the people I already mentioned, are um, carrying over. And the other disclaimer is that, um, in part because we had a bigger group and we discussed um, a few different applications between converging on this uh, science case, we are, I think, a bit uh, farther behind. Uh, in the discussion, so just like bear with us if there's a bunch of things that we still don't know. But the idea, is, I guess, you know, every time you have photometry, you have to think about, you know, SED fitting. And so our idea is um, we are curious about galaxy physical parameters and things like, you know, star formation rates and history, stellar mass, dust mass, AGN fractions. And of course, we know that in LSST, uh, we get uh, six bands, however exquisite. And so really the question is, we know that probably we have a good handle of stellar mass, uh, but we are wondering what complementary data are needed in order to improve on our estimate of um, galaxy physical parameters. And another idea that was brought from the common discussion is that uh, one of our typical problems is that we don't have some way of validating our results, right? You know, like everything that we do in this field is derived by some sort of template or stellar library. Uh, and uh, But something tempting is that we know that if we had resolved stellar populations, we could use color magnitude diagrams. And so what we were thinking is that, is it something that is possible to bring to LSST data? If so, what kind of comparison data would we need to be able to validate, for example, star formation histories um, derived from SD fitting and CMD diagrams? Uh, we anticipate that we will be working with catalogs, um, although clearly we need to give some more thought to uh, what measurement we really need. And so, you know, probably we will not be able to do this or want to do this with, you know, all the galaxies that we have. So just understanding, you know, what queries we may run of like, you know, what subsampling we may need is something that we um, aim to discuss tomorrow. Uh, clearly we'll need external data. Because, uh, and this could be, you know, most likely it would be multi-wavelength photometry, possibly some spectroscopic indicators. And we want to look at this, I think, from two points of view. One is science, right? Okay, you know, like what kind of uh, data do you need to really learn more about galaxies? The other is like validation, which is, uh, let's now focus on LSST, you know, like if I want to use the six bands, uh, you know, to derive something. Is this reliable and in what condition is this reliable? And I think I should mention that Rafael has been running a pipeline that combines LSST data and VISTA data. And so we expect to leverage his expertise in the discussion tomorrow. Uh, our tools will be mostly SED fitting codes and uh, possibly um, a code that can fit color magnitude diagrams, we'll see. We have a lot of technical challenges. I mean, you know, in our few minutes discussion, many emerged. You know, one is like a classic degeneracies of parameters, possibly contaminants. The fact that the data set is very large, and so we'll need to reduce it somehow. You know, like the big question, how you match and calibrate data that come from different surveys. I expect that this list will actually increase in length. And so I think for now, what we are trying to improve a bit on is in, um, you know, getting a better assessment of needs uh, and, uh, you know, clearly the cross-match data. And another potential um, obstacle is that the color to analyze color, the code to analyze color magnitude diagram is not public. So this may be another issue. Okay, thank you, Viviana. Um, in the last uh, two or four minutes, let's go over the 
two last slides, I think that is. Um, Sarah, do you want to? Yeah, I'm here. I'll go very quickly since we're a little bit over. Uh, so in our group, we also have been discussing extragalactic streams with the hope of finding uh, thousands of stellar streams around external galaxies that we could use to decipher accretion histories and maybe also dark matter distributions around other galaxies than the Milky Way. And a disclaimer on my part is that there's actually a white paper from Lene et al. 2019 that goes through some of the um, interesting aspects of using LSST for this. Uh, so some of the info I have here is from that white paper. So they point out that uh, individual images would actually be good to have because of scattered light and how we could handle scattered light in individual images. But otherwise, what would really be of interest is to have stacked images of certain galaxies and mosaics around those where you can really start looking for the low surface brightness features. Um, external data required. And also, sorry, I forgot to mention multiband, so you can kind of get at the colors of these objects and think about the, the metallicities and what might have disrupted to begin with. Um, required extra data could be uh, help to handle serous subtraction and maybe also radial velocity follow-ups of some of the streams if we want to actually learn about the halos of the host galaxies. And then from this white paper, they also go through in detail how you will really, by combining uh, Roman, Rubin, and Euclid, can, can learn a lot more about what's happening with the accreted substructure. So the tools we'll need for this is to first have algorithms that can actually help find these structures and then also um, algorithms that can help, help classify if the structures are streams or shells or other debris structures. And those already exist in some form. And I think the major challenges will be similar to some of the things Shani mentioned uh, just a few slides ago. So it'll be handling background subtraction, star galaxy separation, cir cirrus. Also, the brightness of the main galaxy might need to be taken out in some kind of nice fitting way. And then things that we can already start doing is just thinking about when will we actually be able to see these streams in the data? So what are the limiting magnet or sorry, what are the surface brightness limitations? And that's something I'm interested in digging into tomorrow. Like at what point can we actually start searching for these things in the data? And that's based on theoretical um, estimations from cosmological simulations of how bright these features should be in the data. Um, and we'll go to the last one of the day, um, morphologies with galaxy of galaxies using machine learning. Antonio, do you want to tell us about it? Okay, so we were discussing about the importance of morphology of galaxies um, in the relationship with the other parameters, uh, either the structural or physical parameters, you know, like the correlation with uh, color or stellar mass. So the, this is the motivation to carry out a morphological classification using the state of art uh, in machine learning, that is the unsupervised method. So with this um, method, we can identify basically all objects in, in the images of LSST. So we don't need actually to, to pre-select some kind of objects. So this would be done in the process. Um, basically, to carry out this, uh, this project, we could use all images in uh, through the Rubin Science platform. And we don't really need to, to have very deep observations in the beginning. We can start using basically early observations. And the mode of access, uh, uh, well, sorry, the mode of processing would be uh, would actually to get images or a multi-images uh, multi or a combination of catalogs using SQL or Python -like routines to get this done. And probably we can implement some parallel processing. So to do some tests or preliminary studies, we require some external data, for example, uh, images and morphologies from the Desi Legacy Surveys or the HST. Uh, the tools we require are, as I said, probably we don't really need this, but it would be probably some uh, extra part like the star galaxy separation algorithm. So we don't have to deal with this uh, in the whole training and using some uh, general uh, tools like Siki or AstroPy in the Rubin Science platform. So um, the technical challenge, uh, here we put some 
kind of numbers about the time and the uh, computer time we require for, uh, to carry out this process. So probably it's a lot. This means that we would like to know, we would like to, to have an idea about the uh, infrastructure we will have in LSST so to, we can run the algorithm for the millions of billions of galaxies. And also an important thing is the storage because we will generate models and probably some other images that will require a lot of storage. So well, what is missing now? First of all, we would like to know a lot of the technical details and also probably know about the IDAC that could be a solution to, to do this process. And definitely uh, having an idea about all the resources that the LSST platform will give us. Great. Very happy to close on, on some deep learning uh, at the end of the uh -huh. session. <laughs> uh, so thanks everyone for all of this uh, huge amount of work that you did in just a few, a few hours. Uh, I guess we can give a round of applause for all the speakers. I'm sorry for not keeping an in-person meeting too within the other time. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, and maybe the organizers want to tell us a few yeah, things about the following. So I also just wanted to say thank you because um, I really actually Would you mind standing near the podium for the people on Zoom? It's amazing to see all of the work. There are now five computers or four computers. Fabulous. Um, optimization and parallelization. Thank you. Um, it was, it's been really great to see all of this work being done. Um, there are a couple of things that struck me just going through all of these talks. Um, one was uh, cross-matching, you know, ma matching with external data sets seemed a, a theme that touched so many of the different um, areas of, um, of science. And then I, I confess to being a little surprised by this. It seems like everybody works in an embarrassingly parallel world where if you could, if you had access to a few tens or hundreds of thousands of cores, you could distribute your work across it and bring it back together. Not saying that that's easy, but that, that seems really interesting. Um, lots of people wanted to go back to the images. Uh, and also there was a lot of um, optimization of algorithms and speed up that was required. So I thought those, for me, those were the themes. So just thinking about where we want to be for tomorrow, if you can think about what you've heard and what you see is common, it could be anything from parallel applications to visualization. Just kind of mold that over as, as we come back um, tomorrow morning. So tomorrow we're going to go back to the same work at, um, breakout group. We'd like you this evening, if you have the energy to do this, I um, encourage you to go out and have dinner and then um, take some time to relax a bit. But if you have time to uh, flesh out the either the material you have here or more um, helpfully the, the science use cases. And in particular, Would you mind think going about back here on the podium, please? Oh, Thank you. In, in particular, think about is the information that you really need that you don't have at hand. Examples of that could be there are a number of folks from the Rubin Observatory who are working on the state of the art algorithms, know the data products inside and out. If you want to understand that better, um, just let us know and we can rearrange some of the uh, subgroups to bring that information to you so you can get some insight into it. Uh, so if there's things you don't know, um, let us know tomorrow. Otherwise, we will start out tomorrow with um, uh, going through, trying to go into a little bit more detail and flesh out these science use cases. If you feel like you've got your use case in place and you want to transition to a different group or you want to start on another use case, that's fantastic. We'll do that. At the end of or halfway through the day, we're going to start thinking about technical challenges in the afternoon. So if there are particular things, it could be photometric register, it could be visualization, it could be parallel applications, it could be creating um, uh, doing period finding. We're going to do that break up um, in the afternoon. So just keep that in the back of your head. But thank you so much for all the work you've done. It's been wonderful to have a meeting in person. It's been, certainly for me, it's been very energizing. And uh, please go out and enjoy yourselves, uh, but not too much. So you actually get back in time. <laughs>